Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Nate Polachek. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show, CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with partner and portfolio manager at Commodity Asset, Nate Polachek. Nate and I chatted about his backstory. We discussed misconceptions that investors and advisors have about commodities, the logic behind Nate's trades, and how he gets an edge in trading. He gives us a detailed trade example in Palladium, how he uses options to hold winners, and we discussed trading around a core position. Last but not least, we talked about Nate's white paper on NASCAR factors and its similarities to trading. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Nate. Your wife was a former Jeopardy champion. Both your parents are PhDs. You studied to be a rabbi initially. You worked at Goldman Sachs, Bridgewater. I mean, <laughs> talk about an interesting backstory. Nate, tell me how you got started in trading. Yeah, I actually started uh, getting involved in, in finance as a whole when I was uh, eight years old. Um, my grandfather uh, initially worked for the Navy. He was uh, a mathematician, a PhD, um, and as a retirement job, he took a job as a as a stockbroker. So when I was eight years old, he brought me to his office, and um, you know, computers weren't as widespread back then. We had an S and P booklet, um, which basically listed a bunch of different stocks, and um, he had me look through the book and uh, try to come up with a stock that I thought would be uh, a, a good investment. Um, I spent a couple of hours doing it. Um, the stock I picked was, uh, was, was Exxon. And um, he had me call up one of his clients, um, who happened to have been uh, an elderly cousin of mine, uh, put me on the phone. I spoke with her. I gave her my logic. And she, uh, she bought 60 shares of, uh, of Exxon on my recommendation. Um, and I know hindsight is, of course, 2020. But uh, over the next 15 years, uh, Exxon returned an average of uh, 18% and didn't have a single down year. <laughs> so what was it that captured your interest in trading? Was it the, was it the action? Was it the money? What I like about it is it's very easy to tell when you're right or wrong. I mean, the market is smarter than everyone. Um, you can put on a, put on a bet, um, and the market will tell you right away whether, whether what you did was, uh, was smart or stupid. Um, so it's just a very, very quick way of, uh, of sort of being a litmus test of, uh, of your thinking. Talk to us about your current role at Commodity Asset Management. Yep. So I'm a, a partner and portfolio manager at um, at Commodity Asset Management. Um, we focus specifically on uh, on industrial commodities. I mean, that's an area where we um, we feel that there's still um, an edge from a, from a fundamental perspective in the market. Um, we launched our fund. Uh, Started working on it in, at the end of 2016. Launched our fund in January of uh, 2017, and uh, it's been it's been great so far. Why did you choose the route of working with commodities? So I've been involved in the commodity space for for a long time at some of the larger firms that I worked at, um, predominantly at, uh, at Bridgewater and AQR. Um, and just in terms of looking at the different areas, I mean, it's a market that's very, very interesting. Um, it's a market that people often write off as not really an asset class. And I still think that there's, there's an opportunity for – it's not an overly crowded market, and I, I still think there's an opportunity for, uh, for deep fundamental research into the commodities to, uh, to produce outsized returns. 
Yeah, you and I in a different conversation were talking about the misconceptions that investors and advisors have about commodities. Let's continue that. Tell everybody what those misconceptions are and why they're wrong. Yeah, so I mean, I think investors oftentimes don't view commodities um, as an asset class in and of itself. I mean, they look at stocks, um, which are generally up, you know, about 16, up or down 16% per year. You know, bonds generally up or down about 4% per year. Um, commodities, people often just write it off and say it's just too volatile. I mean, if you look at the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, I mean, that, that's up or down about 24% per year. Um, and then the reality also is that commodities are just not a buy and hold asset class like, like some other you know, areas like stocks maybe. I mean, over the last 18 years, I mean, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index was down nine years and up nine years. And if you look at where the index was at the end of 2001, it was 89. I mean, now it's 79, so it's actually lower. So it's an area where, you're, where there are you know, movements of it um, and there are big movements of it. But, but, but over time, it's not, it's not just something that you buy and you hold. I want to talk a little bit about the logic behind your trades. First off, what markets are you currently focused on in trading? Yep. So we, we focus specifically on uh, industrial commodities. Um, we have two core products. One of them is a uh, futures-only product, um, and that's exchange-traded futures. So it's markets like aluminum, copper, uh, tin, nickel, zinc, lead, platinum, palladium, um, about 12 markets in total that we focus on. Um, we also have another product, which is a uh, commingled fund, which is about 60% futures, 40% equities. And within that fund, we get into some of the more esoteric commodities through equities, which don't have futures contracts, you know, things like beryllium, things like ferrosilicon, been involved in, in uh, you know, so many, brought into the universe quite a bit. So just specifically, though, the industrial commodities complex. Why those products? Again, I think there's, they're, they're just interesting products where there are a lot of very, very large funds um, that may trade in like aluminum or copper. Um, oftentimes the funds um, are trading them based on you know, inventory reports that come out, sort of different momentum-based factors, which are questionable whether they work or not. But if one really, really digs in in terms of the, the supply and demand, in terms of what's really going on on the ground, I think one can, again, one can get an edge. And like our edge is really twofold. Number one is we have a very broad, uh, broad network, um, both amongst myself. I mean, outside of the fund, I've been, uh, been quite involved in, in terms of trading physical commodities as well. So know a lot of warehousers, a lot of miners, a lot of shippers from that. And then the other part of it is, um, you know, we use any, any source of alternative data that we can. I mean, what's working well right now is, um, is imagery. I mean, again, we're tracking 192 facilities around the world. We're looking at nine different investment factors. And again, factors can be as easy and as simple as things like, you know, how many cars are there in a mine parking lot? I mean, you know, day after day, there are 35 cars and then suddenly there are, you know, 115. Well, that's a facility we should probably look into. So it's sort of coupling, and the ideas come from really both. They could start on the physical side or from you know, someone within our network alerting us to something, or they could also start on the, on the data side of something we just see in the numbers. I always ask everybody on this show what their edge is, and without asking you, you just told me your edge is you have a broad network on the physical side, and you guys are really good at alternative data, and you specifically said imagery. Am I correct on that? Yeah, um, and, you know that happens to be a tool that that that's working well right now. Again, who knows whether it's going to be working well sort of down the road? I mean, my background is I have, um, you know, I'm always looking for strategies. You know, I, I came came about through the business with you know defined edge arbitrage oriented strategies, which we um, you know which we traded at Goldman Sachs. I mean, I had a strategy at one point in my career where I could predict with 81 percent accuracy what direction the S and P 500 would go over one minute. And I called it one minute hedge fund and that worked very well, but eventually those edges go away. So the trick is really just to be reinventing oneself and, and, and just always looking for, for new opportunities or new, new, new sources of information. I'm really interested to hear about how you develop a strategy. You're already hearing about your edge with the, with the physical side and the data imagery. Talk to us about any other fundamental analysis that you're using and also if you're using any technical analysis. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I will look at technical analysis, like in terms of a chart of, of sort of 
where the key inflection points and things like that, um, or, or sort of how to get into positions and stuff like that. But I mean, what, what I do is really, really, you know, fundamental in nature. Um, generally I'm looking at sort of, you know, I do investments, which are, which are, can be longer horizon, uh, you know, type of trades, you know, three to six month range. I can also do trade centered around events, which are much more short term in nature. Um, but it's, yeah, really, really stemming from, from the fundamentals um, of, of what's going on in the underlying market. Um, what I like to do is I like to try to look at a theme or look at, look at, you know, some idea of that's been, uh, you know, written up in the market. And I like to try to figure out whether that's right or whether that's not right. And then, um, put on a, a position accordingly. I mean, every position that I put on, another thing is I like to have a point where um, where I get out if it's working for me. Um, and I like to have another point as well where I, I would get out of it if it's not working for me. And again, it's not always binary where you're getting in and out of the whole position. Um, but I think it's always important to do something when something hits a level that you have in mind. What's your average hold time for a position? I mean, average hold time, you know, since we've been doing it is, is generally in the range of three to six months. Um, but again, if you look at the actual trades that we do, I mean, you're going to see some shorter trades, you know, centered around events where we think that we have an edge. Um, you're going to see some, some longer trades. I mean, we've, we've had a, a trade, we've been long palladium um, from March of 2017. I mean, we've traded that around quite a bit. Um, but I mean that's a that's a long position, and we're not just going to get out of something, you know, because we've held it for a while. I mean, we're 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 up on that position. We're up over over eighty percent on that. You mentioned that you use a little bit of technical analysis, but primarily your focus is fundamental analysis. Can you give us an example of how you would use technical analysis in a strategy? Yeah, I mean there are there are definitely sort of key points on the chart where you'll see. Um, sort of looking at the chart and looking at the volume that are traded. Um, it, it, it's important to know, like, you know, if, 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 let's say a commodity, I mean, these things are, are volatile. If it's, let's say it's down 8%, what I'll do is I'll look at, you know, sort of the move and I'll look at how much of the open interest actually came out of it. You know, how much of the move was based on, you know, high frequency traders or people moving the market that are sort of more tourists in the asset class rather than sort of the core holders of it. Um, so that's an area where I'll use more technical things. But again, it's very hard for me to be in a position for, you know, a momentum factor or a technical factor. I mean, these are strategies that, that some people have. You know, I remember reading the, the turtle trading rules. I actually worked with someone whose father was one of the turtles back at, at Bridgewater. I love those things when they work. Um, the issue is I just don't have any of those type of strategies right now that I, that, that I think work enough to, to, to build a product around. Let's go through one of your recent trades from entry to exit, but I want to begin with, before we get into the entry, how the trade set up. Because when I hear a fundamental trader talk about a trade, I want to know how their thought process begins well before they even get to the point of point and clicking. Because I can relate to myself as a technical trader, when the setup is there, it's very clear to me because the technical setup is right in front of my face and I just go and I execute it. But a fundamental trader, it could take a lot of time for this thing to develop. So talk to us about a recent trade from the setup all the way to entry and then exit. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad to talk about the, the you know, the palladium trade that we, we put on. I mean, the idea like in terms of the nexus of that trade, I mean, is looking at the market in palladium. I mean, it's about a 229 ton market. Um, with about, you know, call it about 60 to 65 tons recycled. Um, in terms of like the demand side, about 75% of palladium um, is used in catalytic converters in cars, which are used to reduce emissions. Um, and if you do the math behind it, there are about 100 million vehicles that are produced per year. There's about three grams of palladium in each car. There's about 15 grams of palladium in each truck. Um, and that totals about 330 tons of demand. So the question is, from the supply side, if they're only 229 plus 62, how do you get to 330 tons of demand? Why such an imbalance? So that's sort of a question that we had fundamentally. Um, in order to answer that question, what we do is we talk to our network and we look at different minds, you know, speak to different minds around the world, you know, the Anglo-Americans, which control about 19% of global production, you know, the Impalas, which are about 13.5% of production, the Lonmans, which are about 4.3% of, of, of production. And we'll sort of do our channel checks on that and we'll try to figure out, you know, why are, you know, what's going on with these facilities? Um, why are they not just 
simply producing more. And, and the answer that we came to um, was that at the time, electric vehicles were between 1% and 2% of, uh, of vehicles that were produced. And again, electric vehicles um, will have no need for a, cat a catalytic converter because they just don't emit. Um, and the thought was that by 2025, electric vehicles will be about 16% of the fleet. So it just didn't make sense for the, the producers um, to, to produce in excess and, and sort of expand out their facilities. And we were able to verify this with, um, you know, with imagery and looking at the facilities and looking at how much they're actually pulling from the ground. So that led us to want to put on a long position. Um, we put that on at around $745. Um, and that was in, in March of 2017. I mean, palladium traded as high as, you know, around 1600 um, The trick is we traded it around, you know, we got in, we get out. What I like to do in terms of a trade is I don't just like to buy it. Um, I like to use options as well whenever I can to better manage the risk. So when, when palladium was trading up at about 1550 um, I sold some upside calls. I bought some downside puts. Um, so in a sense, like a short risk reversal, um, where I gave up some of the upside to cap my downside. Um, and then when palladium dropped by, you know, by, by 18%, um, down to the, to the 1350 level, um, I was by and large protected with the option position and I had ammo and was able to, uh, you know, to build up another long position from there and trade that around. So it's being in the trade. It's having a logical thesis behind it. It's very tough to come up with, a, like, a, sort of an exact fair value like people do in the equity world where they say this stock is worth, you know, 44.33. But one can sort of get a good gauge on commodities based on where they've traded in the past to figure out whether they're, you know, undervalued or overvalued um, compared to, you know, other market conditions. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, let's start with the first one I have. How long did this trade take to set up before you actually clicked and got in? Like you said, at seven forty-five. Yeah, I mean, I'll generally, I'll generally, you know, talk around in the market quite a bit before a trade. Um, in terms of this trade, it was about, you know, I'd say, probably about a week, week and a half in terms of like working on the idea before we actually put it on. But I mean, there are definitely, there is definitely in terms of like an investment, quite a bit of research that will go into it um, before one can have the confidence of, of, of putting it on and committing the capital to it. Okay. So let's talk about the entry at 745. Was that just straight outrights futures? Yeah. Straight futures. Generally in terms of sizing of a position, we have some hard, fast rules within our, uh, you know, within our program. We don't want to have any single position more than 25% of the net asset value. I generally like to put on trades initially between, you know, call it around 5% of the fund. Um, and then as they move my way, I'll add to that position. When you got in at 745, did you have a hard stop? Where were you going to be wrong in that trade? Yeah, so... I did have I did have a, a, a stop in mind um, around the 700 level. Um, I generally like to give things, especially when I'm small at the beginning. I like to give things a little bit more room to move my way because, you know, again, as a fundamental investor, you know, there can be a lot of things that happen in the market in terms of short-term events and stuff like that that I don't, you know, I don't have an edge in. Um, but over the long run, you know, my belief is that the, that the thesis will be right. So I generally try to leave a little bit more room. But I'm perfectly willing to stop out of something if, if it's not working my way, you know, initially. Keep it on the burner, uh, set up alerts to, to sort of monitor where that asset is trading, and then, you know, get back in or, or completely reverse and, and go the other way if some new information comes out. Are you working hard stops? Are they based on daily closes? Talk to us about how that works. So it's, it's a little bit more of an art than a science. I mean, what I, what I do with stops is um, I can either, either do it two ways. Number one is I can use options, um, and then that's effectively like having a hard stop in the market because, I mean, the option contracts will, uh, you know, will block you out past a certain level. The other thing that I do is I, uh, I have a 24-hour alert system. So what I'll do is I'll put in my stop levels, both on the upside to get out or both on the downside. Um, and what I'll do is I'll have that alert me, and it's almost like, sort of have using technology as an analyst to go directly into our mobile phones um, and let us know immediately if, if, if the market hits our level so we can make a decision uh, on the spot of how to best trade out of it. So you're in at 745. How are you determining upside targets for this position? I mean, I'm constantly re re sort of re revisiting it as new news come out com comes out about it. I mean, these are markets that are not, you know, you can have 
major things going on on the physical side of it. Um, they're not widely picked up by the media. Um, once the media starts to pick it up and, and, and sort of publish articles about it and things like that, that's when more people start getting involved. Um, so the idea is I'll have a point where I'm, I'm willing to get out of it, um, you know, if it moves largely, if sort of the world figures it out. But a lot of that's sort of based on what information is out there in the market. You know, is there news about it? Is other people, you know, seeing the information that I have? Is it being published? Um, and how the market's reacting and trading towards it. So you're not working any covers for this position right after entry. You're letting it simmer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm letting it simmer. I mean, I, I have, I, you know, I have a point where I'm, I'm willing to get out on the downside. I also have a point where I think it's worth on the upside. So, like, there have been times. I mean, you know, I had a position in commingled fund today that was up, you know, it's up nineteen, nineteen percent at one point on, uh, you know, on earnings intraday, um, on, a, on, a, on a stock position. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, there are there are places where I'll, where I'll get out quick if things happen, you know, a lot quicker than than I expected that they would happen. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a, it's a work in progress, and it's it's looking at. I mean, markets are constantly changing, so it's really just looking at uh, looking at what's out there in the market, what news is out there, um, and being on top of everything. A question people always ask me is, Anthony, how do you learn to hold winners longer? I wish I actually knew that answer <laughs> because I do cover a lot of stuff really early, even when I'm right. But to me, listening to you, it, it goes back to how I've been able to, to hold some winners a little bit longer is because you go into something, you believe in the price that you got in, you believe in the price where you're going to be wrong. And I said, let it simmer. So you're just leaning on the area that you know you're wrong. So if it starts to go your way, you're, you're now reacting to what the market is showing you. Yeah. I think options are also really helpful. Like if you can, you know, make enough money on a position to be able to, you know, protect your downside, but let's say buying a put um, at, at a level where you're comfortable getting out, you can almost sleep well at night. And then you can, I find that personally like a lot easier when I have that on to let my winners go. And then, you know, one can, one can reduce the cost of that by, you know, by selling some, you know, some upside calls. Let's say if you're on the long side, um, to reduce the cost of the hedge. But I mean, hey, I'd be more than happy to get out if it gets if if it gets to that level. Let's talk a little bit more about you adding to the position because you mentioned that once it starts to go your way, you will start to add to a position. What specifically in this trade? triggered you to say, you know what, it's time to add more? Um, part, of it is, part of it is time. I mean, as the market moves my way and you make money in it, um, I realized that, like, this could have more room and, like, the thesis could be stronger. It's talking to people in the network about it and, like, you know, sharing the idea with them and saying, hey, what do you guys think? It's talking to people on the ground, um, you know, that are actually really involved in the physical side of the commodity and saying, hey, like, is this really true? Like, do you agree with that? Um, and part of it's time, like, you know, having it on, seeing, seeing a gain, seeing a gain, and then saying, hey, wow, this has a lot more. Um, it, it's almost like a risk reward. Like, I generally like to make, you know, obviously not hard and fast numbers, but I'm, I, I, I like to make, let's say, like 3x on the upside and not lose more than 1x on the downside, you know, or it's like a sort of a 3 to 1 ratio. Are you adjusting your stop? Uh, as you add to this position, or is that hard stop that you talked about that 700 level, that area that that's just the place where it's wrong and you continue to add marked against that area? Yeah. I mean, I'm trailing the stop up, you know, as, as the position starts to make money, like I'm trailing that stop up, um, and willing to get out of it. Um, I think the other thing is like that I've, I've found helpful is like some valuable advice that I've gotten is like, you know, don't be afraid to take a profit, you know, and, you know, if things go up and things hit your level and like you're, you're short some, let's say you're long or short some calls. I mean, that's okay if you get called away on part of your position. I mean, but the thing is like be versatile enough and like trade it around and be willing to get back in again as well. Something that I learned in my career that has been hugely beneficial to me is learning how to trade around a core position. If I get into an area of the market that I really like and then I get an opportunity to get a target, take some risk off and then look back at that position, which is now smaller than my original position and say, you know what? That area is pretty juicy. We may not go back there. And then to trade new positions 
with different stops and be able to hold that initial core position now that I got it smaller and got some risk off. To me, it sounds that you're doing something very similar. Yeah, I mean, I generally look at P&L, um, you know, for each one of the markets that I trade. But yeah, I mean, I'm not averse to having like a core position in something. And then if there's some, some you know, some short term moves that I think are going to happen, I'm definitely not averse to putting on option positions to try to make some extra money off that off that short term move. But um, but yeah, just keep the core position on. This is exactly why I tell people it's so much easier to learn how to trade by using multiple contracts, because if you aren't in multiple contracts and in your position, you don't have the ability to take some off and then potentially trade around a core position. I mean, this is why trading a one lot, if you're a new trader out there, just trading a one lot so tough because you're forced with a decision of that trade goes your, goes your way, you have to exit the full position. You don't have the ability to hold a winner for a longer period of time. So I just wanted to mention that. Now, I want to move on and talk about a white paper that you wrote uh, that I thought was very interesting. Uh, it, it was about NASCAR, but I really felt it had a comparison to trading in there. Talk to us about this white paper that you wrote uh, about NASCAR factors. Yeah, so um, a coworker of mine at AQR um, sitting behind me on the trading desk, um, you know, asked me if I wanted to learn more about NASCAR. I was like, sure, I don't know a thing about it. Um, he, and um, so he asked, me, he asked me if I wanted to join his, uh, his fantasy league. Um, so I did without knowing anything about it at all. And um, what I found was like NASCAR is a very, sort of a very regulated sport. You know, the cars have to meet a sort of a very specific spec and everything like that. And what I, was, what I did over that first season was just try to come up with different things that I thought could predict um, not only who would win the race, but some of the mid-tier drivers um, who might have been overlooked, you know, what could, what could sort of help them, help them uh, you know, help out, outperform what other people would, would think about. So, again, I'm not a big sports better myself. I'm more approaching it from an, from an academic perspective. But what I'm doing is working on a white paper um, outlining my top factors to, uh, to predict who will, who will win a NASCAR race. And, you know, one of the things that I'm working on right now is, you know, in a typical race, um, sort of depending on whether a track is a longer track or a shorter track. I mean, the driver will make about eight pit stops in a race. They'll spend about, call it six minutes on pit row. So one of the key differentiating factors between drivers is that certain pit crews are just on an average pit stop are, are, are between three and 5% faster than other pit crews. So that's one of the factors that I'm, um, I'm sort of working on right now. But w what I want to do is just come up with a white paper, put all those factors in it, and then, um, you know, send it out to the world and, and, and let other people try to, uh, you know, try to offer feedback as well to, uh, to, to see what comes out. How similar is that to you putting together a trade idea? I think it's similar. I mean, I think one needs to, you know, it's really tough to stay in a position. Like if one, you know, just let's say short something or buy something without having some like logic or some statistics um, around why, is one, why one is in that position. Um, but I think, again, the trick is as, as, a, as a trader or an asset manager is understanding that like what ultimately moves the market is not the research you do. It's, it's whether there are more aggressive buyers or more aggressive sellers. So the trick is recognizing, you know, when your timing might not be right in the trade, being willing to, you know, completely get out of it at a, at a loss, even though you, your logic might be completely sound um, to why you're doing it. And then just, you know, sort of be willing to re revisit or figure out, you know, what you got wrong. Great stuff, Nate. We're not done yet. I have some rapid fire questions next, if you're ready for those. Sure. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Nate, what trader has influenced your life the most and why? I'd say Ray, Ray Dalio um, at Bridgewater. I mean, he's a rational thinker. He's a terrific player coach, um, and he, he quickly recognizes when he's got something wrong and, and makes changes accordingly. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? Um, ability to risk capital um, without 100% knowing the answer. 
How has your trading process evolved over the years? I mean, it's been a sort of a constant evolution to, to new opportunities. I mean, initially when I got into the business, um, we were doing a lot more shorter-term arbitrage opportunities. Um, right now I see the, the, the edge in really sort of longer, longer-term trades and investments. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? So uh, first and foremost, um, definitely passion for markets and just, just loving what they do. Um, regardless of, of uh, you know, sort of what environment they, they're in, you know, the first thing they do in the morning is they wake up and they, if they're not checking it all night, they should be checking it in the morning and, and really love what they're doing. And then second, um, as I think just stamina um, in, the, in these markets, like you've got to play all out um, from, from whistle to whistle. Favorite book about trading? Margin of Safety by Seth Klarman. Favorite movie about trading? Uh, the 1987 PBS documentary Trader with uh, Paul Tudor Jones. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about trading? So this is something that I uh, I overheard at a, at an investor conference. Um, you know, there was a uh, a fund manager that was lauding their performance because they were uh, they were down 17 percent on the year when the index was down 21 percent on the year. Um, and one investor whispered to another investor. You know what? Relative returns don't put gasoline into my yacht. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? Say the the simplest ideas uh, often produce the largest profits. Um, you know, again, ultimately, what moves markets is not the research that you do, but aggressive buy orders and aggressive sell orders, and then finally, just you know, always show up to play. I mean, eighty percent of the profits are made twenty uh, percent of the time. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in trading, what would you say? Diverse network coupled with alternative data. Last question for today, Nate. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not trading? So I call it the playground extravaganza. That's taking my three kids to five or more playgrounds in a single day. <laughs> I love it. Nate, where can people find you on social media, preferably Twitter, and give us a website to check out? Yep. So um, my Twitter is at VigTrader, V-I-G-T-R-A-D-E-R. Um, and our website is uh, www.commodity, C-O-M-M-I-D-I-T-Y, L-P.com. Nate, this was awesome, man. Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show. Very welcome, Anthony. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.